as I said in my in all the remarks, NEP 2020 is something that many of us are very passionate about. People like me, we were also involved in writing some parts of NEP 2020. And in fact, uh, we are at this moment, as we speak, uh, involved in the implementation of NEP 2020. For example, uh, 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 at this moment, we are writing the textbooks for class 6 to class 9, or class 6 to class 12 uh, in the schools, the NCRT textbooks. And the responsibility of writing the science part of the textbooks uh, is on my shoulders. So that's exactly we are trying to do that at the point. So uh, what I wanted to actually say is that if you look at the time period uh, roughly divided by 1947, the time leading to 1947 and the time post 1947, that is India's independence from the colonial powers, uh, one aspect that strikes us is that pre-1947, uh, the time leading to India's independence, we can actually place a large number of celebrities of people who had contributed exceptionally well to our society. I mean, you can name at least 20 of if all names, but not his number as what pre-1947. Right? So number of people that we can actually think of pre-1947 and post-1947 is somewhat stuck. And we must ask question to ourselves, what is it that we have done that we have not given the word kind of personalities like Dr. Baba Sahib Ambedkar or Dr. Mahatma Gandhi uh, after 1947? That's a very deep question to ask ourselves. There are many answers. All answers are not right. All answers are not wrong. There are many different views that different people have. Uh, one of the views that has been expressed is that the way we evolved our education system in the country was an adoption of the education system that we had taken uh, taken over from the British and the British education system was such that it was geared towards producing people to run the British government or the colonial government over our country. So that is uh, a view expressed by a section of people and therefore what has happened is that we have actually created a whole bunch of people like me uh, who have been good in cracking different examinations and also serving the government in some respect or other. In fact, the four year period that I spent in Delhi was a very revealing period for me personally. Uh, I spent a lot of time with the career bureaucrats, the IS officers, who had come to Delhi as secretaries of different departments and different ministries. There were nine of us who were not career bureaucrats, nine of us had come horizontally as secretaries, but the rest, about 60 or 70 of them, were IS officers who had become secretaries, and we used to spend a lot of time with them. And typically, we would joke with all the career bureaucrats that today you are an IS officer and a secretary to the government of India, but the same you also were able to crack IIT JE examination 25 30 years ago. The same you we are also able to crack the IIM Ambavad or different IIM examination and the same you has also been able to crack the civil services examination, IS officer. In a sense, what we created is a generation of people who could crack any examination that they appear for. Was that the objective of our society? Was that the objective of our education system? That we create a bunch of people who are good at cracking examination. Unfortunately, that trend has continued till recently and we are actually trying to even today generate, uh, to create a generation of people who are good in cracking different competitive examination. And for most of us, this approach is not right. This approach is basically a faulty approach. That I had in Delhi, with some of the top leadership, including the Honorable Prime Minister of India, number of things that we would talk about was, for example, the people who are good at cracking exams, for example, IIT, JE, etc. Right? A large number of students write JE, etc. 
in a few lakhs, about 10 or 12 lakhs students across India every year appear at the IIT JE exam. And only about 20,000 of them are eventually selected to be a part of that select club that goes to IIT. Many times, some of the students crack the JE exam in their second, third, fourth, or fifth attempt. Right? But out of the lakhs of students who have appeared, more than 98% of them do not crack the exam and they go to state universities, state colleges, and so on and so forth. Does it mean that you have a two tier system in the country? Those who are very elitist, those who go to IITs and NITs, and those who are not elitists who go to state universities and colleges? That is a very fundamental question to ask ourselves. And in fact, the Honorable Prime Minister himself was so passionate and he used to say that talent is abundant in every corner of the country. Talent is not present only in our elitist institutions, but we have hidden talent all over the place. What we have not been able to do is tap that particular talent. Right? The students who have not been able to secure admissions in the elitist institutes and are equally innovative and are equally motivated as those who go in very elite institutes such as IIMs and IITs and so on and so forth. Our challenge is to tap that particular talent. So people of my age group and the teachers in this audience, that is the challenge that we need to really address so that the students in the audience actually benefit by that particular exposure. And that's precisely what the new education policy 2020 has been devised for. So the education policy envisages that we make good citizens of tomorrow and we don't make citizens who are good at cracking exams. Right? That is the principal objective of NEP 2020 that in nation building we need good citizens of tomorrow and that's precisely the students of this audience is what is expected of you in years from now. Now how do we teach our youngsters to become socially responsible, socially aware and contribute to nation building? A challenge by itself. If you look at human race itself for example, Homo sapiens is the human race. We believe that we have been a successful race amongst all other living matter on the planet. We believe so. Our belief may be right, our belief may be wrong. But one thing that characterizes us, there are many things that characterize us from many different living forms, but one thing that characterizes us from others is what we call or we are extremely social species. We are very, very social species, we help each other. And when we became a social species, like some others, for example ants and honeybees and all those are social species. But we have one characteristic that stands out. And that is called as the principle of reciprocity. A principle of reciprocity essentially says that if an individual A does something good to individual B, the individual B reciprocates the good behavior and behaves well with individual A. So the two individuals actually display reciprocal behavior. You are good to me and therefore I am good to you. You scratch my back, I scratch your back. Right? That's the reciprocal behavior. But that's not all. There's something called indirect reciprocity. Now this is a very fundamental issue that social scientists have deliberated upon in the last few years. And that is, an individual A does something good to individual B and as a reciprocal behavior, individual B does something good to individual C and not A. So it's not a pair of individuals, but if I am good to a particular individual, that individual is good to some another individual, not necessarily me. And that is something called as indirect reciprocity. And all good societies around the world are built upon this indirect reciprocity. Right? The successful nations that we see around the world are built upon this indirect reciprocity principle. A common example of indirect reciprocity is like this. If I want to go 
let us say from MGM College to Kasturba Medical College or rather I want to come the other way from Kasturba Medical College to MGM College here. For my own benefit, I would prefer to come in the wrong direction so that I don't have to go further and take a U-turn. Right? What I am actually violating here is a principle of indirect reciprocity. I will follow the principle of indirect reciprocity only if I go on the right side of the road. So all those of us here in this audience who come wrong side just to save some time for ourselves and get to the destination in a very short time, we are violating the basic principle of humanity. And as long as we violate basic principles of humanity such as indirect reciprocity, we can never aspire to be a great nation. Trust me. The nations which are currently what we call as Global South, indirect reciprocity is rare to observe. The nations what we call as Global North, the indirect reciprocity is actually quite common to be observed. Paying our taxes for example. If we all pay our taxes to the government as per what we are entitled to, we are displaying the principle of indirect reciprocity. If we don't do that, if we avoid paying taxes and keep gathering the money with ourselves, we are violating that principle of indirect reciprocity. And once again, as long as we keep violating the principle of indirect reciprocity, we are actually violating the fundamental principle of humanity and we cannot aspire to be a great nation. Now some of these things are going to be taught in the schools and colleges and higher education in the coming time as per NEP 2020. This is not exactly what is going to be taught, but when we want to make great citizens of tomorrow, what we want to generate is a, what we want to create is a generation which is aware of all these holistic patterns. Right? The education, to give a holistic education to every individual is the aim. And when we give holistic education, we start, for example, in class 6, the first chapter that we have written is that about geodiversity and biodiversity. You might ask this kid is about only 10 or 11 years old, why are we teaching geodiversity and biodiversity to that kid? The principle is that a good citizen would not put any pressure on biodiversity and geodiversity. And not only class 6, we teach this at every possible level. Every class in school or college or higher education we keep at it, we keep teaching the students that how to be a good citizens by being good on your environment, being good on your biodiversity and being good on our diversity itself in society. It's only then we can build an inclusive society. It's only then that we can actually build a sustainable society for the future. So holistic education is one of the aspects of NEP 2020. And those of you who have actually read the document of NEP 2020 would recognize the fact that a student is allowed to take different kinds of credits. For example, a student who is pursuing MSc in Physics, Masters in Physics, that student is perfectly within rights to take a course or credit a course, for example, in Dramatics or in Music. In my generation, people would have asked, why should a Physics student learn Music? Right? That question will no more be asked. A student's choice, a student wishes to take a degree in master's degree in physics, but yet credit a course in music, that's a very far-reaching recommendation of any different degree. And that is what we call as a holistic education. Exposure to different branches of knowledge, exposure to different branches of learning, is what we actually want to impart on the next generation such as yours. And for that, we have created what is called as an academic bank of credit. You know, all of you are aware of the academic bank of credits. As you pursue your courses in any of the colleges, any of the universities in the country, you can go on accumulating your credits. And these credits will be ascribed to you in a particular bank. UTC is right now creating an academic bank of credits. You will get a degree of a particular university that you are enrolled in. And it is a fantastic thing. Today, 
You think that a particular course is taught very well in Manipal, by all means you should take that particular course and enroll yourself uh, for a basic degree in that course. But if you think that one particular course is better taught either in Banaras or in Chennai, by all means you should take your chance going to that place and take those credits in Banaras or in Chennai. And that actually will lead you to exposure to a different kind of an environment in a different place. And that's what we believe actually is one of the fundamental aspects of building next generation of citizens for the country. One of the recommendations is also education in mother tongue. Now as I am speaking here in my mother tongue, I had my education in Marathi medium till I was in class 10th and my first full sentence in English I spoke when I enrolled myself for PhD in 1984 in Indian Institute of Science Bangalore. Prior to that, I had not spoken a grammatically correct sentence in English. That also had different kinds of effects on my education. There are many principles of physics, my basic degrees in physics, that actually I had not understood. Because the English words were alien to me. Right? When I learned Boyle's law, for example, V is equal to IR, I could not understand the meaning of word resistance. Today, having known English enough, I can actually place a meaning to the word resistance, but not when I was in class 10. And therefore, it is extremely important that we allow children to take courses in their own mother tongues. This is not something that we are new talking about. This is followed in many parts of the world. You go to Japan, for example, or go to Germany, or go to China. The basic fundamental education is imparted in mother tongue because we are way more comfortable in learning principles and basics in our own mother tongue. For example, if I ask you to multiply any two numbers, let us say 7 into 13, right? I always do calculations in my mind in Marathi and translate the number into English. Let me ask a question in this audience. How many of you do calculations in your mind, in your mother tongue, before translating that number into English? If you can raise your hands. How many of you do the multiplications and divisions in your mother tongue and not in English? There are quite a few. There are quite a few, right? That's because we are way more comfortable in understanding our mother tongue and speaking our mother tongue. English is an alien language to all of us. Right? And that's therefore one of the recommendations of NP is allow children to learn in their own mother tongue. It's going to be an extraordinary challenge. A place like Manipal, which probably attracts students from all over the country. And if you say that I have to teach here students in Tamil, students in Hindi, students in Bengali, students in Assamese, I think that's going to be an impossible task. But yet, we have to find means of doing that. Right? And if we are able to pull it off, despite being such a multicultural, multilinguistic society, I think we would have pulled off a miracle for the coming time. And therefore, our endeavor also would be, in some sense, try to see how we actually impart education in our mother tongue. One of the things that New Education Policy also talks about is something called multiple entry, multiple exit. Correct? Uh, I don't know whether some of you have heard of this particular aspect. Multiple entry, multiple exit. Just to give a very small example, if one enrolls for integrated master's program in any of the subjects, in any, in any economics, let us say, right, after 12, you enroll into a five-year MA economics program. And after four years, you think that you don't deserve to continue for another year in the same subject. So NP 2020 has a provision for exit after four years by just taking a bachelor's degree. So the four year bachelor degree program, the essential background is because that we want to have children who can have multiple entry, multiple exit programs. That also has another aspect to consider for that. The societal pressure, the students will agree with me here, the younger students, the societal pressure, the peer pressure, the teacher pressure 
and the parental pressure is trying to drive you into a particular kind of curriculum. Right? All of these, your teachers, your parents, your peers are trying to drive you to get admission either in engineering or in medicine. Thinking that if you become an engineer or a doctor, a successful engineer or a successful doctor, your future will be secure. If you don't become a successful engineer or a successful doctor, your future will not be secure. Now that's what we have been told so far. What we have not been able to, what we have not been told so far is that the large number of people in the society who have been successful in their respective professions, whatever professions they have been in, whether it be music, whether it be creative arts, whether it be journalism, or any other profession, who are not engineers or doctors, and have been successful because they chose their passion to pursue in their college or in their postgraduate degree. I know enough number of children of my friends who did not wish to be engineers and doctors, but my friends put on parental pressure that they should become engineers or doctors. And invariably, these children, these kids, what they would do is just to satisfy their parents, they would get a basic degree, also from some of the top ranking institutes in the country, and then, after collecting the degree, tell their parents, see I have a degree, now let me do what I want, and then completely change the path and enroll themselves, for example, in Film and Archives Institute or uh, Journalism School, and so on and so forth. And in fact, if you look at many of the IIT graduates of yesteryears, many of the people who have IIT degrees are actually not engineers. They are senior IS officers, they are successful business people, and some of them like Chetan Bhagat are also very successful authors. You ask the question, did an IIT degree help this person? Answer is a mixed answer, maybe yes, maybe no. But the profession that this kind of people actually followed later has essentially nothing to do with the kind of professional courses that undergo. And therefore it's very important to pursue their passion, what they like, and not force opinion of the society, not force opinion of the peers, not force opinion of the parents, and not force opinion of the teachers on what course or what learning this particular ch child would like to do. That's a very, very important aspect that all of us must keep in our mind. And therefore, if you want to generate a, 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 a future generation in the country, this is an extremely important point. One of the things that we used to speak in Delhi, talk in Delhi, and once again uh, at a highest level, was the recognition of the fact that we don't recognize failures in our society. Very often, we look at only successful examples. We don't look at failures. And this actually once again is the fallacy of our society. Most societies around the world take failures as step stones or steps for the future successes. And for all of you younger generation here, you must realize that it's okay to fail in your life. It's okay to fail in your exams. It's okay if you don't get a job or do something else, it's okay if you have a startup to fail in that startup. It's perfectly okay. As long as you learn from your failure. And the learning from the failure, if you use for your future endeavor, success is guaranteed for all of you. And the same thing is true for people like me, my generation, that anyone around us, the younger people, if they fail in what they are doing, we should not look at that as a failure, but rather as a stick for future success of that, of that particular individual. I want to tell you a short story about a student who was in my day. Uh, this student uh, had come from Bits Bilani and we had a memorandum of understanding with Bits Bilani that their dual degree students who were pursuing five years program would do projects in our lab. I was then at the Center for DNA Fingerprinting and Diagnostics in Hyderabad so some of the students would do projects with us. And this student came to my lab. He was a master's in physics student. There's one degree that he was pursuing. And he was also pursuing B in electronics. So a dual degree program in Bits 
I gave him a project to work on graph theory and to try to understand how graph theory helps us in understanding the relative principle, the interactions among different entities and so on and so forth. This student had absolutely no interest in working at graph theory. In fact, had no interest in getting his masters in physics in the first class. He was in fact ignoring all the things that we have been actually told to him. So after about six months in a one year project, I called him and I said that your uh, demeanor doesn't look good to me. That do you want actually the degree in physics or not? Or do you want to work on the project that I have actually given you or not? Mind you, it's a very important thing. He told me that, sir, I have some very different aspirations in my life. Alright? I have very different aspirations in my life. I asked him, what are your aspirations? He said, sir, I want to become a successful entrepreneur. I am going to tell you the name and you will be shocked to hear the name. So I told him that the remaining six months, you actually present a plan to me that how are you going to generate a successful entrepreneurship. Give me a business plan. The business plan should have management, the business plan should have finances and the business plan should have technical details so that at least I can uh, help you in trying to see from my point of view whether it will be successful or not. I will also run your business plan through some of my friends who are business people and you can take their comments what they feel about the business plan. And the student was very enthusiastic. He actually prepared a project and a copy of the project is, lies very proudly in my lab. As soon as he went out, when he collected his degree, he started his entrepreneurship. Four times he failed. He started something and then he failed. And eventually, he went on with two of his colleagues to form a company, what we call today as Swiggy. So the founder of Swiggy, Nandan Reddy, was my student in the lab as a one-year project student. And it's amazing. And that is the potential that each one of you in this audience has. Each one of you has the potential of being another Nandan Reddy. Right? So if you have entrepreneurial orientation, I think you must follow that particular person. If you have a musical orientation, you must follow that person. If you have a journalistic orientation, you must follow that person. Don't listen to your children, don't listen to your teacher, don't listen to your parents. Go ahead and be what you want to be in future. You may fail once that you will succeed one day. The example of Nandan Reddy is illustrative in many other matters. As I said, the peer pressure and parental pressure is on us because our parents want to want us to have a secure job in future. After we collect our degree from wherever, our parents would like, us, would like us to have a secure job so that we can support our families and so on and so forth. Let us do another hypothesis. Instead of securing a job, if you become a job provider yourself, you don't do a job, but you provide job to many others. And that's exactly what Nandan Reddy has done. When he founded Swiggy, he is not doing a job himself, but he is providing job to thousands of others in our society. So do you have that in you, that instead of you doing a job, you will be able to provide jobs to thousands of other citizens in the country. I think our country would be a different place if this mindset actually comes in. That instead of chasing jobs, and trust me, the number of jobs that are available in the country is a fraction of what the number of aspiring people for those jobs. Trust me, in the next 10 years, we are going to see new 800 to 900 million people. 800 to 900 million people coming into the job market in the next 10 years. People like you. 800 million is a huge number. What is the total number of jobs in the country? The government jobs, 
and the private sector, the reliances and data and all, peanuts, a fraction of this number, a small fraction of this 800 billion. So our job situation on one hand appears to be great, but on the other is also very really encouraging because there are people in the audience here who would like to make business successful businesses. And in that process, you are not only securing a job for yourself, but also you will be providing jobs to many, many others like you. And this can actually have a cascading effect. Really? Entrepreneurship, startups, and other things, other matters like this, can have a cascading effect on society. And as we look around the world today, there are many countries who have actually taken this particular route, where large number of successful startups are actually emerging. And in fact, some of the European nations today, they are contributing as close as one trillion dollars of economy to their countries, the startups themselves. And in fact, if you look at examples of some other countries, let us say example of UK, except United Kingdom. The number of successful startups, what we call as unicorns, in UK alone is more than many of its neighbors put together. And it's amazing how some sort of societies have been able to do that. And whether a country like India, where innovation is abound in our society, every nook and corner of the country, there are innovative people who reside there. And it's this innovation, if we are able to tap, I think we would have served our purpose of building our society of the future, which is resilient society, which is very conscious, Society which knows about its environment and other people all around us. If you are able to do that, I am pretty sure next 25 years what we call as the Amrit Kaal will be able to achieve that dream of Amrit Kaal. People like me will not be around in 2047, but there are many people, younger students here, you will be around in 2047. And if we are to realize that dream, all of us must work together. And all of us must try to see that we can implement the NEP 2020 in its true spirit. If we are able to implement NEP 2020 in the true spirit, as some of the few points that are highlighted here, I am pretty sure that Amrit belongs to all of us in this particular audience. All the very best to all of you, and thank you very much for giving me this opportunity. My classmate from the year 1972. 1974, IIT Bombay, chemistry, chemistry. And this, this boy, first year, summer managed, and IIT Bombay was competitive. He was 17 students. Okay, three labs, six per lab. Six per lab would be 18, we were 17. In the second year, he said, I'm not going to. He sat outside his room in the hostel and was looking at the birds outside. Three months later, he joined the Indian Forest Service. He left IIT Bombay without finishing his chemistry chemistry. Went and joined the Indian Forest Service. Two years later, came back and told them that I want to finish my chemistry. Came back, they said, remember you are what, juniors. He said, doesn't matter. Came back and finished his MSc chemistry. He retired as a chief conservator of forest of Karnataka. That is the spirit. And I love this spirit which happens in Manipur. I have got so many students here who joined engineering, who joined engineering but are now in theatre. So many of them, he knows. Ranga Paisa knows so many of them. They are in Yakshagan. In fact, one of the students does not know Kamera, but now is performing Kamera Theatre. That is the spirit which just depends on you. It just depends on you, how you do it. So I will now, I will give one interesting, a couple of small interesting things. I can go on talking for hours together, don't, don't let me do that. I will give you a couple of interesting examples. There is a very big scientist called E.O. Wilson from Harvard. He found that termites have a habit of burying their head. 
you know what I mean by the word slime? They take moment a termite dies, four of them will come and say, take them on the shoulders and take it to the burial ground. They have a burial ground which is separate from the place they stay. I am only going to talk two examples of termites. So he was very curious, how do the termites know that this termite is dead? So he did research. He is a very good social scientist, social scientist, very real scientist as we call him. And found that when the termite dies, it secretes a chemical called the pheromone, which indicates to the other termite that this termite is dead. Okay? And you can take it. Now he's a scientist like me and you and everybody else. Proof. It's a theory proof. He actually took that chemical and put it on a live termite. And lo and behold, that live termite was taken to burial ground. This is the how the termites ensure that they why do we bury people? We bury people and bury people because we don't want the unfortunate things of health conditions to occur to the people who are alive. So this is what he did. One more example of termites. On the planet and so on and so forth. Uh, uh, let me say very clearly that uh, when you want to measure some quality for a large group of people, right, which is the most productive nation in the world as far as scientific quality is concerned, for example, no index can really capture the true spirit of that particular nation. Right? So happiness index is one of those that the index cannot really capture uh, uh, because the number of parameters they have chosen or the number of questions they would have asked people are you really happy? And a uh, 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 large number of people have said yes, and therefore they become the happiest country. Uh, I don't think it's right. Economically, some countries are very, very prosperous, they're very affluent, and economic affluence does not necessarily mean happy. Right? I mean, the, you see a uh, uh, great number of examples uh, where uh, 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 there is no economic affluence, for example, in India, but the people seem to be perfectly happy singing songs, dancing, and so on and so forth. Now, the, some of the happiness index indices are clearly faulty because for the reason that the countries which have been the, the shown as rank number one, rank number two, rank number three also have very high separation rate post marriage. So, people there, the husband and wife, they get married and few years later they separate. But yet, these countries have been categorized as happy countries. So, uh, my take really on this particular index is that these kind of indices are clearly faulty. And I think they are good only to read and keep your attention by reading that particular article. But uh, 30 seconds after that, one must forget that particular article and move on with other things. Into water shortage country by today, on an average, we uh, are short. And we are actually leading another 10 years or so, 10 to 15 years, into water stress country. That water will not be available as much as what we have. And that's not very far away. For the generation of young students here, the day is not very far, where we are actually living very rapidly to water stress country. Now, how do we actually uh, 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 tackle this particular issue? You know, the the balance to actually make sure that uh, we of course use water very judiciously, but also the water has to be used in a circular manner. You know, when, the, the, when we talk of circular economy, water is actually a very good example. Uh, this will give an example Bangalore today. All of you have heard that Bangalore has a severe water shortage on today's day. Right? It's surprising to find out that Bangalore's municipal waste water is actually not treated, is taken far away and dumped in places like Pura and Sonoshosu. The country which aspires to be a developed country, very affluent country by 2047, I think this is an unacceptable practice. Absolutely unacceptable practice. We have to learn to recycle water. A municipal waste water must be recycled and uh, that water must be used for good use in our own neighborhood. So whatever water that we use must be treated so that the same water can be reused again. You know, so these are the basic fundamental principles of sustainability uh, that you would have probably heard of. Reuse, recycle, refuse and all those things. Three hours, four hours or whatever you call. Uh, it applies equally well to water and therefore a circular use of water is absolutely important 
for all our future developments. And I'm glad that you raised this particular issue, the sustainable development or uh, the, the, the economic influence of future would depend upon many of the factors such as water is one example, but there are many other things that we must actually learn to use in circular manner so that we don't put any pressure on the environment or the extraction of nature about those kind of things.